One, two, three, four. This is Don Coffey Jr., longtime drummer for alternative rock band Super Drag and current drummer for Mick Harrison and The High Score. I met Don long ago, just after both our bands got signed to our first major label deals. His was to Elektra and ours was to Reprise. We bonded backstage in New York over similar drum pedals and our aggressive styles of playing. Don is a real slammer and brought extreme acceleration to the Super Drag tunes. Their first release, Regretfully Yours, was chock full of high energy loud pop tunes, including Destination Ursa Major and the radio smash Sucked Out. We continued to cross paths through the late 90s playing similar radio festival shows across the states. By the time my band fizzled out, Super Drag was getting ready to release their much anticipated follow up, Head Trip in Every Key, produced by Jerry Finn. It was around this time when I started a one man band called Pris, where I played all the instruments. I was heavily influenced by Head Trip. The first single off Head Trip was called Do the Vampire. This song blew my mind at the time. I think I wrote three complete songs ripping off elements of this one tune. Soon after Head Trip, for various reasons, Super Drag and Elektra parted ways. Fast forward to 2008, after many side and solo projects, Super Drag reunited to record a new full length entitled Industry Giants. They continued to tour through 2009 to support this release. After this tour run, they again became inactive and began playing in other projects and releasing more solo records. Currently Don is rocking the kit in Mick Harrison and the High Score. They have a song called Let the Motor Run, available on their Bandcamp site. Let the Motor Run is a high energy alternative Americana jam that hits all the right spots, with its dark mood, twangy yet heavy guitars, thick drums, and catchy chorus. It actually sounds like Knoxville to me. Somewhere in between The Replacements, Tom Petty, The Toadies, Husker Du, and maybe a little Sunvolt meets Better Than Ezra? I don't know, that's a reach, but somewhere in there. A full length should be coming out sometime in the fall of 2020. Keep an eye out for it. Until then, you can go to their website, mickharrison.com, that's M-I-C-H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N.com, their Facebook, their Instagram, their YouTube, or their Twitter. Let's check in with Don and see how he's doing. Uh, how are you? I know I'm you probably, this is really weird. You don't even remember me, but um, so uh, I'm, I'm just- Actually, before we get started here, yeah. um, I do remember you, I remember your band, and oh. um, you have an Uber fan. <laughs> His name is Sean Lawton, mm. and he used to be from DC, but now he lives in Colorado Springs. And he quizzed my wife the other day and asked her if she knew every word to a particular album. <laughs> and he did it over the phone. Oh my God. So yeah. Wow. Who knew? <laughs> what were you great. doing? That's crazy. I, I thought that band uh, would have been long forgotten, but, uh, those were those were those were pretty good times. Uh, the you know the nineties. Um, what were you doing in West Virginia? Uh, my in laws are up there, oh, okay. and uh, my son's getting ready to go back to school, or maybe not go back to school. And we needed to run run a trip up there before that started because uh, it's a long story. But yeah, yeah we yeah. need that. Uh, cool. Um, 
So the reason I started this channel is, uh, like I mentioned, I got in a bad accident last year. Um, I tell this story briefly on all these interviews. <clears throat> um, and so I ended up having spine surgery, broke ribs, and had to sew my left ear back on, all this stuff. It was after a, a concert, the first show of a tour that I was starting on. Um, so I was distracting myself last year, like this thing didn't happen. I, I started playing shows right away, you know, horribly. I wasn't strong enough yet, but I was just like, distracting myself this year everything's been so slow um that just to take take me out of the self-pity thing i just i said well what if i reach out to all, like all everyone who's influenced me and see if they just want to you know chat just to put positive stuff out there because there's so much bad news going on and um it's actually been gaining a lot of momentum i'm surprised because i don't i'm i'm not i don't do this i don't like talk i'm not social i don't know the facebook and instagram stuff i'm like teaching myself iMovie and all this but you know, once I got, uh, you know, Martin Chambers from The Pretenders and then, and then Chris from Talking Hands, I'm like, wow, I'm in too deep now. I've got to learn how to do this. Um, so, like, yeah, um, kind of the thing. It was like Ringo, Martin Chambers. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. Well, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Greg, Greg is the drummer for everyone. He's yeah. in the dream, too. So, your new band is uh, Mick Harrison and the High Score. Is that yes, it? Yes, sir. Um, and then is that, is that record out now or is it coming out the let the motor run? Is that the song or is that the title of the, like a full length? No, that's a single. Yeah. And we're, we're kind of in the same boat. Everybody else is. We, uh, we were, we do a lot of one-offs, you yeah. know, we don't do so much get in the band and go do two weeks anymore. Um, so we were doing one-offs and all this stuff happened. It's like, well, this would be a good time to make a record. And uh, everybody got a little bit tired of doing the um, um, stage hits and the different acoustic like things. And they're like, well, let's put something out. So I think we're probably going to remaster Motor, but the name of the album will be Bright Spot, I think. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at maybe the fall, but it kind of just depends on how things go, I guess, right? Yeah. So did you have a whole bunch of dates set up and then it just all came to a halt? Or you um, still work? You were still writing. No, we never have a whole bunch yeah. of dates, set, but yeah. it's. It, uh, but we were kind of in the middle of like, we had a few shows left to wrap up, and and we were kind of already working on a record, and then it kind of just went full speed to doing the record, and so that's kind of where that went. I got you. I want I want to play a couple seconds of that just in case one of these people watching. Yeah, I mean, I recognize that drum sound. <laughs> Very consistent. That's cool. Um, so I noticed in the credits that you you mixed that, or you mixed the all the songs. Are you an are you a, an engineer as well, or a mixer? Yeah, I've been doing that. Um, I did the. A, it's kind of a complicated story, but when when Super Drag got off of Electra, yep. The next records i was involved in the engineering side of that i had some help on the first one i had a little bit of help on the second one and then after that the band kind of went its separate ways and i kind of started up my own thing here in knoxville and started recording bands and so i took 10 years off when i had a kid about 10 years ago he's 12 now so 12 years ago and uh i didn't pick up drums drumsticks for 10 years yeah and then Mick Harrison and the high score guys, which they've been a band for like 17 years now and uh, with rolling members or whatever, but they've been a band a really long time. And I've worked with them over the years in different bands too. Um, then they called me and they were like, we need a drummer for tonight. Hmm. And then turned into a three year like thing so far for me, but I'm still the new guy. You know, <laughs> I gotcha. Well, a well uh, seasoned new guy. Um, do you mind if we chat about the old days just a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Uh, cool. So, yeah, the first time I met you, um, we probably were signed about the same time. And then, you know, the label starts sending you out on these kind of collaboration or festival type shows where there's like four or five young bands or newly signed bands at the same show. And then, you you know, you travel around the city like 
at, at one of them I remember was in New York and it was uh, us muzzle. You got super drag. There was Ash and not a surf. I know you guys have played not a surf a lot. And that's the first when I met you where we were backstage, you know, fiddling around with drum stuff and we both had the same kick pedal and that's, we had got in a conversation about that. And uh, then I watched you play and I was like, wow, that's really similar. We have, we have similar styles, very emotional, aggressive, strong, heavy pop. Yeah, pop. I, I, re I remember that Ash show. They had a gigantic banner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the lit up. They had a lot of, yeah, that was, and then we went out with that to support them. I think it was right before that or right after that. And we, we had a lot of fun. Um, Crazy time. Good, good boys. And they're still chugging away. Yeah. They're still cool. doing it. Um, but there was all these nineties bands, you know, that, that they kept clumping together, like uh, presence, the United States and tripping Daisy and velocity girl and, and Ash. And like, uh, there's one fun loving criminals, velocity girl. Yeah. And, and then, and I remember another festival in Springfield, Massachusetts, you guys were playing a separate stage or something. And we were walking around you, you kept seeing these similar bands there newly signed that they clumping each other too. Um, but it was, it was really cool. So like during that time, what, uh, right when you started hitting the road, when you got a, a little bit of money and you're playing these bigger shows, do you remember like an, ex do you remember a moment or, um, or a particular show where you're like, wow, I didn't think I'd be here. Like that was cool. I just met someone, you know, that I was looked up to, or I can't believe we sold that place out. Or do you remember one particular show? Um, I mean, I have a ton of those. Yeah. Uh, have um, I remember when um, we were running around with Not a Surf there a while. We were both on the same record label, and um, we were both in the same sort of people were involved. We kind of cross pollinating people at Electra, and um, we got to go over to Europe. That was a big deal, you know. I think that was probably through like BMG or something. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of a big deal. I never thought I'd get out of Knoxville, much less get out of the country. But uh, so that was kind of a big deal. And um, I remember on that same, we were down in Florida, uh, not a surf and super drag. We kind of alternated nights, you know. It was like, well, they they're going to do better here than we are, mm -hmm. so we'll open and that kind of thing. And um, um, and all of a sudden, people started showing up. Mm -hmm. And we started playing bigger venues and we had no idea what was going on. And it turned out MTV was still a thing back then. Right. And they, had, they had a big thing going on and I, I guess we had a big thing going on. And the next thing I know, it's like we're playing in theaters instead of 200 seat clubs, you know? So that was a thing. But the one was a similar thing to what you brought up about being in Massachusetts. We were somewhere up in the Northeast and we were playing a fair and um, Paul Westerberg was on one stage and Tommy Keene was playing guitar with him. And I was a huge Tommy Keene going all the way, Tommy Keene fan going all the way back to songs on a film and stuff like that. And he was playing guitar in Westerberg's band. And by this time, Westerberg kind of cleaning up the act for the whole band, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. And, and Tommy was Tommy Keene was looking for a beer, and he came over to our little like trailer, and it was a trailer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's like, "Anybody got any beer?" And I was like, "Holy, <laughs> you're Tommy Keene!" You know, <laughs> that was probably one of the coolest. And he was just was nice as could be, and you know, it's always yeah. great. They're nice, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think the very first tour that we did that the label sent us out on was supporting Fred Schneider, of the B-52s. And he just put out a solo record and it was a punk record. So we put together this kind of super band of punk guys and then he was doing his normal thing, you know. Um, but he was so fun on tour. He would always like, we were, we were always playing a, a PlayStation hockey in the van and backstage <laughs> and, Oh, and one time we were like, uh, I think we were at the cat's cradle and, and, uh, right after sound check and he, I just I see this head poke in and he's like, what y'all doing playing PlayStation hockey in here with the, with this wow. Athens draw. It, it was pretty cool, but he was like really friendly and supportive during that whole thing. And of course his B-52s fans came out in, in droves, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you, uh, were you self-taught or, or? Did you have lessons once you fell in love with the drums? Um, I was mostly self-taught. I yeah. would say 
95% self-taught, uh, a little cruddy drum kit. Yeah. Uh, um, and a boom box and listening to classic rock radio, basically. Um, but then I got in a band and, um, I felt like I needed to be better. Like I, I felt like there were things I didn't know. Mm. And, um, uh, I went and took a lesson and the guy started harping on the way I held the sticks and he was right. Yeah. You know, thumbs on the inside as opposed to like working it like a hammer. It took me a few years to like come around to that deal, but that was it for me. I was like, I play pretty fast. I don't need this crap, but I should have listened to him and I should have kept taking lessons. <laughs> Yeah, well, along that line, um, you know, this, this, this theme of the channel is musicians who are coming back from injuries or just things that they have to deal with that are nagging while they're on the road because of p performing every night, um, maybe daily rituals, supplements, anything like that, um, compared to the old days where you're just playing every night and you're just bashing it out, maybe holding the sticks improperly, you know, putting your arms and your joints in harm's way. Um, did you have any moments where you were running into problems back then when you were touring so much? Um, not back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this and all the, I'm sure all the guys you interview for this thing is they they play so much that you just kind of get used to the way you play. It's when you stop playing mm -hmm. and take 10 years off and you don't pick up any drumsticks over the course of that time. And then someone asks you to play and it's like, whoa, I thought this would be like getting back on a bicycle, but it's yeah. not. Mm -hmm. And the things that used to be easy are no longer easy. And the things that you used to be able to do almost effortlessly and goof off while you were doing it, it's gone. And mm -hmm. that, that was difficult. That, that first show I played after 10 years of being off, that was difficult. And then, the other thing that I've learned over the last three years or so is that one-offs are really difficult. You know, it was back in the day when we were doing things, you would go out, you might, you know, woodshed for a week or something like that before you took off on the run. And then it was kind of the same show with a couple of different things sprinkled in every night, but it was kind of the same thing for months at a time. And pretty soon, you're playing the song so fast, it's so easy, it's so effortless that you actually got to kind of like go the other direction and kind of where's the groove, where's the mm. stuff. And that was a process over the course of those times. But now with the, doing the one on things, it's like we play for two hours and I'm sore for three days. Yep. Yep. There is something about playing back to back to back to back, which, you know, builds the muscles and, and, um, you, you know, aerobic endurance and all that stuff. Even sure. I remember a time where, you know, we'd be tour just, we'd be going into the studio to like mix the record, taking just a few weeks off and then just play, Oh, you guys have to go downtown to play this one little thing at the last minute to, for whatever rock stars touring to you guys support. And we're like unrehearsed. We just show up at the thing, you know, thinking we could do it. Yeah, we're on a label now. We can, you know, we can do this. Totally felt left-handed, left-footed, weak, you know. And it sounds weird. Yeah. You Disjunct. get that? Yeah. I mean, it's like you've been in there. You've been listening to pretty decent speakers in a studio situation. I call it studio head. Mm -hmm. And you're in there and you're listening to it for weeks or months or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden it's like, go play a show and you hit the kick drum. And it's like, dunk, dunk. <laughs> it's like, yeah. this is not what a kick drum sounds like. I mean, yeah. I don't know what it sounds like, but yeah, yeah, it actually sounds like that. And that, that's frustrating, you know, or when there was a string section and now there's no string section because you're back to <laughs> four piece, you know, it's, that's frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> when you guys uh, were, were, building your crowd back in the day it, it was in knoxville is that right yeah pretty much okay i grew up in la and then i moved to seattle and that's where muzzle came from from seattle um so i know i know what it, it's like to you know try to get a band together in la it's much different than seattle seattle's very condensed very competitive la you need a car it takes forever to get from one place to the other. And there's not so much a scene, there's a collection of scenes around. 
Seattle is, is very, so you could, you can ride a bike across Seattle, you know, um, in just a very short time and there's clubs everywhere. So, um, it was easy to get into a band. Um, and you knew every band, you knew it was much more of a close community. What was Knoxville like when you guys finally got the lineup together and you were playing shows and, and building a crowd? Were there other bands that were sounding like you or were, did you totally stick out? Um, if I had to like one word, Knoxville, it's eclectic. Mm. Um, you know, Mick Harrison, who I've been in a band with now, he was in a band called the V-Roys. And that was Americana before Americana was cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were doing our thing. And then, you know, Todd Steed, who's a Knoxville legend from here, who's been playing music for 30 or 40 years. He had a band called um, Smoking Dave and the Primo Dopes. And I mean, totally out there, totally different than anything I've ever heard. And there's a lot of bands from Knoxville that are like that. Now that's not to say that there's not bands that are more radio friendly or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit I'm a little bit out of touch with things today, but back then there weren't a whole lot of places to play. Mm -hmm. And the places that there were to play sound system wise were uh, subpar to say it politely. And, um, you know, it was just a, it was a wild time. But the thing was, it was competitive, like you say about Seattle, but everybody got along and everybody kind of rooted for each other. And it wasn't like, we want to take a gig from you or if there wasn't any of that kind of thing. It was mm -hmm. just more like a, um, all for one, one for all. And it always, it always, it always has been that way around here. It's like everybody kind of pushes each other, you know, like, I'm sure it's this way in Seattle too, but you know, the V Roy's and Super Dragon were on opposite ends of the spectrum. And all we cared about was which band sold the most beer. <laughs> that was it. And so we'd go play a club and they'd play a club and we'd be like, Well, how much did you sell? And how much did you sell? And you know, that was kind of the thing. Yeah. Did you have to go to Nashville? Did Nashville have rock clubs? Did Knoxville have rock clubs? And if not, did you have to go to Nashville or did they welcome rock? sound at that time knoxville was pretty much punk rock scene hmm. and um uh, it was i mean if you had to like rock, draw a picture in a punk rock book about a punk rock club we had plenty of those oh, okay. and when i when i say that i mean you know we were playing in you know a place called the china king which was a chinese restaurant in the daytime but at night you know it was kind of whatever. Um, so it was like that. Um, there was a place called the library that was kind of a legendary like club where I saw Guadalcanal Diary and R.E.M. and all of those kind of bands back in the 80s, late 80s, whatever. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, it's a, it's a pretty, Knoxville is a pretty punk rock, uh, hillbilly, you know, we have, uh, great college radio station here still to this day and it was great back then and we have uh, one of the top Americana stations in the country here and we have the number one country station in all of America here with the most yeah. kilowatt I mean it's crazy so there's a lot of music around here and a lot of history and a lot of you know it just depends on what you're into I suppose but um, and it's not it's not clicky you yeah. know we all like wanted to be the best, but at the same time, it's like, we all, we all ended up going out on the road with each other anyway. You know, I've always wanted to spend more time there. It's just been passing through on tours. Um, I got to spend a little time in Nashville last year for this Mapex uh, artist thing where you meet all the Mapex rock stars and they show off the new product and stuff. But Knoxville, it was always just, we're just staying there. We're not playing there. And so I wasn't able to, <clears throat> um, investigate the scene at all. But I do remember that their subways, at least one or two of them that I saw were painted, were painted um, volunteer orange. And I thought that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a thing here. Yeah. Uh, oh, as far as the Nashville part of it goes, um, getting into Nashville, if you're from Knoxville, and getting into Atlanta, getting into those two markets, if you're from here, mm -hmm. has been additionally very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, they have good 
really good rock clubs, you know, Exit End being one in Nashville, or at least it was back in the day. I don't know about now. It's been a long time since I've played there. But they have a, a 12th and Porter. I mean, there's lots of places to play. But getting in there, because the competition in Nashville is so tough, you know, it was one of those deals where you might have to take a show on a Monday, drive down there, play for nothing, and drive back that night, you know, which is not bad. It's just four hours, but still. Yeah. It's hard to build a fan base there because there's so many bands in Nashville, and Atlanta's a lot like that. I was just talking to Mike um, from the Goo Goo Dolls, who's based just outside of Nashville, and I was explaining uh, when I went out to Nashville last year, um, just I never knew it was that condensed full of musicians. Like people were just constantly dragging gear across the street, you know, in the middle of the day, going from show to show. And I was saying, well, it must be pretty easy if you can play a little bit, you know, to, to get a gig. And he just said the talent level out here is just off the charts. And everyone, you know, a lot of people move in looking for a job. And he's like, I don't know what to say. You know, I'm lucky to have the Tanya Tucker gig. You know, it's working for me. But I'm, I don't know what to say. You just got to work hard. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, after Muzzle and before I hooked up playing for Duff, um, I had this one-man band called pris and i played all the instruments and it was it was power pop stuff and i put stuff out in the states on a label called loveless and then in japan on the power pop academy label and i definitely stole it i definitely made three songs three complete songs just out of do the vampire song <laughs> there's so many there's so many cool things just in that one song that it, to, that was new to my ears when you know when it came out and i was like and um they were they were popular songs like they got on seattle radio and stuff like that and i was like i always knew how i connected that you know it was it was so cool like the drum accents and in the uh the the chord fingerings and stuff like that and so um yeah jerry, that was yeah go ahead I'm sorry. oh no i was just gonna say uh jerry finn produced that one is that right he did yeah um that was an interesting one though because um john uh the singer and super uh went up to new york i don't know for maybe a week or 10 days or something and he hung out with adam schlesinger for a little while mm. and, uh, i don't know i used to but i don't know now which parts who, that who wrote but adam had a part in that mm. and uh I think it's the bridge, but that, that was, that song got added on to the record after the record was done because I guess they didn't think we had a single or something. And so they put that on there. And, um, that was one of those deals where the record label sitting in the room with you while you're doing it, you know, and the guy, the A and R guy sitting right beside the drum kit while I'm playing the drums. And so that was kind of odd, you know, why I don't is that? Wanna, it is just like, <laughs> you know, I guess they got stuff riding on it too. You know, I mean, like, I do have experiences that are very similar to that. I was just curious why, like, not a producer or an engineer, an A and R guy. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, well, I mean, if you have similar experience, then you know. But I mean, they got, you know, they're they're <laughs> gambling on you, and when you don't. When they, when they don't feel like you're delivering or they're getting feedback maybe from the record label that says, yeah. you know, radio department says we can't do anything with this, then, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of tough for them too. So they want to be involved and I get that. Um, another band I play for, this band called Vendetta Red, it's kind of, uh, you know, alternative rock, aggressive stuff or whatever. There's one record we did <clears throat> with uh, Howard Benson and nice. that was, that was my experience with that kind of money's on the line situation where the record is complete it's mixed and everything and you you hit the road you go out on some other thing and then you get a, a call saying you got to go back to la and do a quick thing um and then we fly back to la and just to do a chorus for the single you know re right. they're going to insert it and to me like i hear that sounds weird to me there's edits in there like i didn't that doesn't sound very natural but he had, he had, he's a radio guy and a radio hits guy, and he had this thing in mind. Evidently, you know, it worked to some extent, but they're very unnatural, you know. I'm yeah, not, but that's awesome that it worked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll leave it up to him. If it keeps you out there on the road for a while and you can make 
make some bread at it, I think it's okay. Yeah. You know, that does come up a lot in, in some of these conversations. Uh, like I was interviewing uh, my friend Murphy from Sugar Ray and that song, their first hit fly, which was actually my second record. That was a very last second add on at the end when they're all depressed and they're going to give up and it's just not working. And then this thing comes out of nowhere and then they get David Kahn to produce it and they get super cat and then they go with this new sound. And yeah. uh, that song, The Reason by Hoobastank, very last. That record was already done. They threw it at the very end. So yeah. it doesn't surprise me at all. I um, think it has probably more like that than people know. Mm -hmm. um, were there any memories of uh, how Jerry produced, maybe how he produced the drums or just, just his technique overall that, um, that, you, that you remember that you liked or didn't like? Well, um, well, first he, he of all, produced, he produced Vendetta Red's first record. That's why I'm making this uh, parallel. Yeah, no, uh, he, he uh, we were going to make that record at um, Ardent Studios in Memphis. And we'd always wanted to work there in part because we're all replacement fans, but we're also all ZZ Top fans. And, you know, that studio is a Tennessee historic studio. It's maybe not Sun, but it's right up there. Yeah. And uh, so we wanted to make it there. And Jerry, for whatever reason, there's more than one, uh, couldn't make it work there. So we, we went to LA and we went to Sound City. And the drum room in Sound City obviously is, you know, I mean, they make movies about it. I mean, it's yeah. <laughs> ginormous and it's, you know, if you can't get a, a big drum sound there, you can't get a big drum sound anywhere. Yeah. Um, Jerry had worked in that room before. Um, uh, the mic, the mic stuff was not anything. If you're working on that level, that would be any kind of big surprise. You know, coal microphones, uh, coal. Sorry, um, you know, sixty sevens, eighty sevens, just everywhere. I don't know how many tracks of drums, but a lot. You know, room mics stereo pairs, you know, stuff four feet out from the kick drum, you know, yeah. uh, underneath the snare, uh, you know, just stuff everywhere. It took up the whole room. And then, you know, the guys that work there, the assistants, they're all like, you know, writing signs and taping them up to the mic stands. Don't touch, don't touch, don't touch everywhere, you know. Um, as as far as like what he would have done compared to somebody else, I don't really know, but I wrote it all down. <laughs> <laughs> the mic cable comes from this specific microphone into this mic pre, and that's how I learned to do it. Yeah, and I don't have that stuff, <laughs> but the principle is the same. Yeah, you know, um, he is recording with some compression that uh, a lot of people are afraid to do. Um, he kind of tailor makes like the tracking session to uh, he's kind of, he was kind of mixing as he went, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, he was kind of laying out the whole thing as it was going to be when it was all it was, it was going to be a little thing here or a little thing there. You know, um, we didn't use pro tools on that record that I know of <laughs> <laughs> behind the scenes, maybe, <laughs> but that, and that was the last one of those that we made without there's so proof. many different ways. There's, producers have so many different styles, you know, the minimalist and just over the top full strings and just take weeks just to set the mics up for drums. Um, I just interviewed Rob Ellis from the PJ Harvey band that her first trio his first few records. He's a producer now. And I was asking him about working with Steve Albini and like how he would produce, you know, differently. And uh, he was saying Albini's more of like the techie guy. He's, he knows all the gear and the mics and the chords and how to sh set stuff up and stuff, but wasn't so much a creative guy. And I've run into producers who are very creative, not so much technical. You know, they have a right-hand man to do all that. Right. Um, and so he's more the, he's more the composition and, and throwing in creative ideas and arranging and stuff like that. Um, and then Albini was more of the, the technical stuff and i've you know from whatever bands whatever records i've run into so many different kinds i would say i might be like right down the middle i actually went to school to be an audio engineer in la 
right before I moved to Seattle. I didn't even go to my graduation. My car was already packed. I like, I need to get out of LA. Went to Seattle. I didn't know anyone. I answered like six ads. So I started playing six bands right away just to, just to meet people. And one of them got signed. And now I'm not, I would, you know, I'm self-taught like, okay, I, I guess I'm a touring drummer now, you know, I've got to take this seriously. Yeah. It's awesome. So, so it's kind of a mix. Like I still love to record bands. I still compose for like corporate ads and, and, in kids TV shows and stuff like that. And then I, I teach here at the house, but playing live, I think is definitely like my biggest, um, love, you know, um, connecting with the band and sweating it out and stuff like that. Yeah. I think I'm kind of the opposite. Mm. Um, yeah, I think I, I much prefer to spend every day in the recording studio and mm. just make, you know, but I, I, I like to play live if it makes sense. But a lot of times when you're, I mean, we are, we're, we might, we'll play a song, we'll play a show once every two months or something like that. And that's hard to stay in shape when you're not doing that and you're not recording. If you're recording, you can play, yeah. you know, a little bit every day or whatever. But when you're not playing and you just got to do the one off and no one wants to get together to practice and you just got to show up and like do it, it's, it's carrying the load, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, I miss, I do miss going out and doing runs. I miss going out and doing two weeks, you know, uh, five days on, two days off. I miss that. Get out know. of town a little bit, see some new faces. Yeah. Um, you guys reunited. I'm not going to go through your whole life story and all that, but you reunited in 2008 with the uh, industry giants. Is that, and then um, are there any, are any memories that, was that a good experience for you? And are you guys still in contact now? Um, well, anytime I get to hang out with those dudes, it's a fun experience. You know, um, there were some challenges. Um, half the band lived in Nashville and half the band lived in Knoxville. We had to work out how we were going to rehearse. And um, that was a little bit difficult. Um, but overall, I had a really good experience with it. I mean, it was, um, uh, we recorded in Nashville. So, you know, it was kind of like I was driving all the time, doing stuff, trying to make it help make it happen. And it was just, uh, it was, and I had a kid at that time. I was, he was about one. And so that was difficult, but, but the experience of going out and playing and mostly, you know, I always worked the merch booth. So seeing all the people again was fun, you know, um, that and that's always kind of been a highlight for me. It's like the show is the show, but after the show's over, that's when the fun starts. And yeah. you know, you can make some money too. That's great. But you know, being around the people and you know, people, you know, you, I'm sure you experience the same thing. People, I mean, you'll see somebody in Richmond, Virginia, and the next time you see them, it'll be in Pittsburgh, and you're like, I thought you were from <laughs> Richmond. But, you know. I see that's, that a lot when we're doing the UK stuff with stuff like there's people who travel. You know. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. They'll come from all over the place. You know, it's like, it's the only time they're going to play. So we got to go. Right. So yeah, yeah it's cool. <clears throat> um, so what's your, you were saying that, what was the time range you were saying that the Mick Harrison stuff you thought would even, was going to be out for the world to hear? I think it'll be out in the fall. Mm -hmm. but you know with everything going on it's kind of hard to predict but we are three songs away from being mixed and um i think we have the mastering thing sorted out which usually doesn't happen this early in the deal for me anyway yeah so i think we found a guy that we want to use and so we're, we're in the process of getting it all lined up and sorted out are there any uh, drum endorsement stuff that you need to uh, say thanks to or anything that you've been playing on for a long time that you just fell in love with? Um, well, I'm not endorsed by anyone anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, back in the day, a long time ago, around the Jerry Finn time, yeah. um, but I won't go into the whole story, but <laughs> let's just say I got a pork pie kit out of that deal and I love that drum kit. Yeah. I'm not endorsed by them. I'm not telling anybody to run out there and get one. I'm just saying 
the kit that you hear on that record is this kit. Mm. And I, <laughs> so. On the was, uh, Head Trip record? It's Pork Yeah. Clock? Okay. I'm talking to uh, Butch Norton. Um, he's a drummer for everybody. If, back in that day, he was with the Eels, but now he's with Lucinda Williams. Yeah. And Tracy. He's a Pork Pie guy. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, you know, I never, I didn't, I never, even back then, I didn't have an endorsement. I had a, yeah. I think I had a Sabian endorsement for a short time, but I kept breaking them and sending them back and they cut me out of the deal. But <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let you keep them. Just keep them and we're moving on. No, you oh, got to send them like, back. But you got to, you know, you got to send them back to show, prove it that they, you broke them. Oh, yeah. Know, that's crazy. Yeah, that's, yeah. Cool. that's true. You know what? I'm really, um, I'm really, um, grateful that you accepted to talk with me a little bit and we were able to reconnect this is cool oh man i'm super honored i mean the people you're interviewing and stuff is like that's that's up here i'm just yeah. glad to be i'm just glad I to be, don't want to sell yourself short no no i'm just glad to be involved at all and i'm glad you're getting healthier and you're yeah. getting ready to back out there and rock it a little bit every day is an adventure Every day's an adventure. I hook myself up to electricity and try yoga stuff. I, I used to run every day, like seven to 10 miles a day, even like pre and post show. So that's the one thing I miss is the running. I can't run yet. I can walk and drum and stuff like that, but I really miss the running stuff. So it'll come back. It'll yeah, come back. I hope so. That's the positive thinking I'm talking about. That's right. It'll come back. <laughs> hey, um, Thanks. Thanks so much again. Um, when this is done, I'll, I'll send you the, the little link and um, yeah, again, if you, if you wanted anything uh, deleted out of this, just let me know. Um, Cause I've had a couple sensitive situations, but I'm, I'm, I'm a good editor. So. All right. Man, anything <laughs> you need to make it better or whatever, I'll do it. Cool, man. Good luck to you. Right. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bert. Appreciate it. Talk to you later. All right, man.